About a year ago, I uploaded a video about how to create fonts in Inkscape, but some things have changed since then, so I decided to do an update. In this video, I'll also show you how to convert an SVG font that we create in Inkscape into a true type or open type font using Font Forge, a free and open source font editor. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is go up here to the text menu and open up the SVG font editor by choosing it here. And now in the global settings tab, we want to create a new font by clicking the plus button here. The name of the font doesn't really matter, as it won't be used when we convert the font in Font Forge. But if we wanted to rename it anyway, we could click on the name and type a new one. Alright, now let's take a look at these font attributes and font face attributes. First we have horizontal advanced X. This is basically the default width to use for each character or glyph in our font. We can change this to increase or decrease the spacing between all of the glyphs. And as we'll see later, we can also set the advanced for each individual glyph. Next we have Horizontal Origin X and Horizontal Origin Y. This is the point at which the drawing of the glyphs will begin. I'm not really sure why we might want to change this, so if anyone knows, please let us know in the comments. But anyway, we can just leave it on the defaults of 00. Next we have Family Name. Unlike the name of the font itself, the family name will be used when we convert the font to true type or open type. If you go to the text tool, the family name is what will show up in this box up here. I'll just change mine to something like my font. Okay, before we talk about the remaining attributes, let's go ahead and click the setup canvas button down here. Alright, so what this does is, it first resizes the page here so that each side is the length of the M size attribute in pixels. So M size is basically the size of the box where we want to draw each glyph of the font. We also get guidelines across the page that correspond to the values of the other font face attributes. First baseline here refers to an invisible line that goes across the bottom of most of the glyphs in our font. And above it we have X height, which is where we want the top of most lowercase letters in our font to reach. For example, if we type a lowercase a and scale it up, we'd want to have it fill up most of the space between baseline and X height. Below baseline we have descender, and the space between baseline and descender is where we want to put parts of glyphs that extend below the baseline such as the tail of a lowercase y. Above x height is caps. This is where we want the tops of most capital letters in our font to reach. Finally, the space between caps and ascender is where we want to put parts of a glyph that might extend beyond caps. For example, although it isn't the case with this font, in some fonts, the vertical stroke of certain letters, like the lowercase h, might be taller than caps. Now it's important to know that all of these are just guidelines for helping us line up the glyphs in our font so that everything looks nice and even, and they will be different depending on the font we're creating. For example, we might want the descender to be shorter, so we can change it to something like 150 here, and click the setup button again to readjust everything. Or we might want the X height to be taller. It really doesn't matter. We could also completely ignore the guidelines, like if we wanted to create some crazy looking font. Okay, and before we actually start creating a font, one more thing to know is that if we're planning to convert our font to open type, we can leave M size here on 1000. But if we're planning to convert it to true type, we should change M size to a power of 2 value. Whether to use open type or true type is a pretty advanced topic, and for our purposes, it doesn't matter which one we choose, because the process will be the same and everything will work correctly regardless. But just for demonstration purposes, I'll change the M size to 1024 and click the setup button again to readjust everything. We can also go ahead and delete any text objects that we created. Alright, now let's head over to the Glyphs tab. And this tab is where we can start adding glyphs to our font. Let's begin by clicking the plus button here. The first glyph it adds is the space character, which has a Unicode value of 20. If we click inside the characters box here, we can see that the box contains a space. We're actually going to deal with the space character a bit later, so for now, let's delete the space in this box and replace it with, say, a lowercase a, and press enter. This will automatically change the Unicode box's value to the Unicode for a lowercase a. Another box we have here is name. It's not too important that we give a name to each glyph, but it will help us with identifying and sorting the glyphs, so let's also put a lowercase a in here and press enter. Alright, and now we need to actually draw the glyph on the canvas. But before we do this, we need to click the edit button here. Every time we click the plus button, it adds a new layer to our document. And when we choose a glyph in the list and click the edit button, it switches us to the layer for that glyph and hides all of the other layers. As we can see down here in the status bar, 
The name of the layer is the Unicode value, followed by the character, then the name. If we click this to open up the Layers and Objects dialog, we can see that the font editor created a layer using the name of our font, and inside this layer, we have a sublayer for the lowercase a glyph. Okay, so now let's go back to the font editor. To draw the glyph, we can use the shape tools, or the path tools, or any combination of them. To keep things simple, I'll just use the calligraphy tool here. Okay, now I'll draw a lowercase a in the space between the baseline and the x height. The color we use for the glyphs doesn't really matter. We could even just use a stroke instead of a fill if we wanted to. All of this will be ignored when we convert the font. And when we go to use the font later, it will default to having a black fill with no stroke like other fonts. Okay, and we could just leave the glyph vertically centered in the box like this. However, when we go to use the font later, all of this space on the left and right of the glyph is going to show up between the glyph and any other glyphs that we type. This might be what we want, but if we want our font to be more compact, we can reduce the default width of all of the glyphs. If we go back to the Global Settings tab, we learned earlier that the Horizontal Advanced X attribute here refers to the default width of every glyph in the font, so we can lower this value to lower the width. But first, we want to figure out a good width to use for our font. To do this, let's first go to the Select tool and move the A closer to the left side of the box. Now let's drag out a vertical guideline by clicking and dragging from the ruler here on the left and put it to the right of the A. We don't want it too close to the A because a lot of our glyphs are going to be wider than the A. Around here should be good. And by the way, if you don't see the rulers, you can go to View, Show Hide, Rulers. Okay, now let's hover over the vertical guideline until we see a hand icon, then double click. And here we can see the exact location of the guideline's origin as well as change it. If we change the units here to pixels, the X value is what we want to use for the horizontal advance X. For simplicity, I'll set it to 700 and click OK. Then set Horizontal Advanced X to 700. Okay, now let's go back to the Glyphs tab. One more thing we want to do is select all of the objects that we want to use as the glyph and go to Path, Union. This will turn everything into a single path and fill in any gaps that might have been caused by parts of the paths overlapping each other. All of this is necessary in order for the font to work correctly. Okay, now with the path selected, let's click the Get Curves button up here. This fills in the glyph box with the selected path. Now if we type some lowercase a's into this preview text box down here, we can see what the glyph will look like when typed out. Not bad. However, because the default width for our font is so much wider than the a, there's a bit too much space to the right of it. To fix this, we can change the width of just the lowercase a. That's what the advanced box here is for. Let's try setting it to something like 500. Much better. Okay, we're finished with the lowercase a, so now let's work on another glyph. First, let's click the plus button. This automatically fills in the Unicode and character boxes of the new glyph using the next character that we're likely to be creating, which in our case is the lowercase b. This is quite helpful when we're creating an entire font. However, instead of creating a lowercase b right now, let's go ahead and create an uppercase a. I'll put an uppercase a in both the character box and the name box. Now let's click Edit, which hides the lowercase a layer and switches us to the uppercase a layer. Now we can draw the uppercase a glyph. I have it filling up the area between baseline and caps and reaching the vertical guideline. Alright, now let's select all of the objects and go to Path, Union. Then click the Get Curves button, which fills in the glyph box. And now we can type some uppercase and lowercase a's in the preview text box to make sure they work properly. Next, let's create a lowercase i. First, let's click the plus button, change characters and name to a lowercase i, then click Edit and draw the glyph. For the dot of the i, I'm actually going to use the Circles and Ellipses tool to create a circle. Now I'll select both objects and union them together. Then click the Get Curves button. Now if we add some lowercase i's to the preview text, there's of course going to be too much spacing on the right side. So we can set Advanced here to something like 200. Now the spacing between the two i's looks okay but we might want to add some extra spacing between the i and the lowercase a. 
To add spacing between a particular pair of glyphs, we use the kerning tab. First we use these two boxes to select the two glyphs that we want to add spacing or kerning between, and the order in which we choose the glyphs matters. Because we want to increase the kerning when the A is to the right of the I, we need to choose the I for the first box and the lowercase a for the second one. Now we can click the Add Pair button, then adjust the kerning with the kerning value slider down here. That's better. Okay, now let's go back to the Glyphs tab. Let's create a lowercase f. First, let's click the plus button and change characters to a lowercase f and name to a lowercase f. Then let's click Edit, draw the glyph. Then union it all together. And click Get Curves. Let's give it an advance of around 300. Okay, now let's put some lowercase f's and i's in the preview text. I'm going to change the advance to 400. There we go. Alright, so at the moment, the f's and i's come up side by side as expected. However, it's common practice to combine the glyphs of certain letters, like lowercase f's and i's, into a single glyph. This combination of glyphs is called a ligature. To create a ligature for the lowercase f and i, let's click the plus button. And for the characters box, let's type in a lowercase f followed by a lowercase i with no space between them. And we can do the same for the name box. Now let's click the edit button. Then we can draw a glyph that looks like an f and an i combined together. Now let's select all of it, do path union, then click get curves. Now unfortunately, Inkscape doesn't actually give us any sign that it works, since it doesn't change what's in the glyph box, and it also doesn't change anything in the preview text. But when we import the font into Font Forge later, we'll be able to test it and see that it works. Another thing we can do is create a stylized version of a glyph. For example, we might want to be able to type a fancy lowercase f for whatever reason. To do this, we first need to decide what combination of characters we'll need to type in order to get the stylized character. For a stylized lowercase f, we can, for example, make it so that typing three lowercase f's in a row will give us the stylized version. Okay, so first, let's click the plus button, and for the characters and name boxes, let's put three lowercase f's side by side. Then let's click edit and draw our fancy f. Alright, now let's do union on all of these. Then click get curves. And like with ligatures, we're not able to check in Inkscape that this works. But in Font Forge, we'll see that typing FFF will produce the stylized F. Okay, now let's see how we can add a space character to our font. First, let's click the plus button. Then click inside the characters box. And let's press the space bar to replace the letter with a space. Then press enter. And for the name, we can use the word space. And we don't actually need to add a glyph for the space character. If we put a space somewhere in the preview text, we can see that it adds a space using the default width of the font. But of course we can decrease the width by changing the space's advanced to something like 300. Alright, so at the moment, we of course have a lot of missing glyphs in our font. If we type any missing glyphs into the preview text, they will show up as black boxes. If we wanted to replace all of the missing glyphs with a particular glyph, for example the lowercase a, we can first select the lowercase a item here and click edit, then select this path. Now we can open up this missing glyph section here, and if we click the from selection button, it will replace all of the missing glyphs with the selected path. However, if we don't do this, when we convert the font in Font Forge, we will actually replace all of the missing glyphs with matching glyphs from a default font. This is fine for testing purposes, so we can click the reset button here to remove the path from the missing glyphs. Okay, we're next going to save our Inkscape document, then open it up in Font Forge and see how to convert the SVG font into either a true type font or an open type font. If you would like to add some more glyphs to your font, be sure to do so before continuing. All right, to save the document, let's go to File, Save. It doesn't matter what we use as the name, so I'll just name it Font and click Save. To download Font Forge, 
We go to fontforge.org, then click the download button at the top and choose the operating system here. I'm using Windows, so I'll choose the Windows option. We can give a donation if we want, then click confirm and download down here, then download the installer with this button. Okay, once we've installed FontForge and open it up, we should get this open font dialog. And here we can browse to the location where we saved the Inkscape font document, then select the document and click OK. And now we should see all of our glyphs here. Now one thing you'll likely notice straight away is that the glyphs are a bit too high up in the boxes. If we convert the font when it's like this, it will cause problems when we go to use the font. Fortunately, this is very easy to fix. And to do so, we first need to select all of the glyphs by pressing Ctrl A, then right click one and choose Transform. In here, we want to set the Y value to negative 200. And make sure the checkboxes that start with the word Transform here are all checked. Now let's click OK. This shifts all of the glyphs down by 200 units, which I found will make everything work correctly. Another thing we can do in Font Forge is we can double click a glyph to open it up in the glyph editor, where we can do things like move around parts of the path, similar to what we can do using the node tool in Inkscape. Okay, and if we close this out, we can go to metrics, new metrics window, and in this box here, we can type our glyphs to make sure they work correctly. We can also test out the ligatures, like the FI combination, as well as check that the stylized lowercase f works by typing FFF. Okay, let's close out this window. To convert the font, we go to File, Generate Fonts. And here we can choose where we want to save the file, as well as change the name of the file, which isn't really important. And here, we can choose the format that we want to use, including true type and open type. I'll go with the normal true type format here. Now we can click the generate button. We will likely get a message saying that our font contains some errors. Fixing these errors is beyond the scope of this video. And if you take a look at the Font Forge documentation, it will tell you how to go about correcting each one. But in any case, the font will actually still work correctly regardless of the errors. So we can ignore them for now and click generate. All right, now if we open up the folder that we chose as a location for the generated font file, we should see our font file inside. If we double click the file, we can see that the font name here is whatever we use as the family name for the font in Inkscape's SVG font editor. And we can see that the sample text down here uses the glyphs we created and that it replaced all of the missing glyphs with glyphs from a default font. If we were actually going to use this font for more than testing purposes, we of course would want to create our own glyphs for each of the glyphs in the font. All right, now if we click the install button up here, it will install the font on our system and we'll be able to use it like we could any other font we have installed. In order to use it in Inkscape, however, we first need to close out of Inkscape completely, then open up a new document. Okay, with a new Inkscape document open, we can go to the text tool, and if we drop down the font family box up here, we should see our fonts. Mine is called My Fonts. And if we select it, we can start typing out some text using the font. We can type FI to make sure the ligature works, and type FFF to make sure the fancy F works. Okay, so that's how we can create a font using Inkscape and Font Forge. I hope this video was helpful, and I hope it cleared up some things if you happen to have watched the previous one. Thank you very much for watching.